Um, before we do, let's let's do some introductions in case anyone's sort of been living under a rock and don't know who you two are. I'll start with myself. So my name is Aaron Evans. I work for an organisation called Flow State, and I've brought this webinar about. And the reason I brought this webinar about is really really simple. I've had the pleasure of interviewing both of these gentlemen individually, um, and it's really interesting to see how in sync and lockstep they are in the way that they think about things. In most cases, obviously, there are they they do have different opinions on some. So I, I, I thought it'd be a good idea to bring them both together for your enjoyment so you can actually get an insight into the wonderful research that you guys have done, the well-developed and formulated opinions they have as well. And we thought there was no better topic to tackle than the future of selling. So Matt, why don't we start with you? Do you want to give us, give us a quick intro to who you are, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I'm uh, uh, Brent's longtime uh, sidekick and uh, <laughs> partner in crime. So uh, I actually, Brent and I worked together for, um, uh, we actually, oddly enough, came from the same kind of uh, background. He and I are both trained academics, so um, I'll let Brent talk about his his fascinating career before becoming a sales researcher, but my own was uh, that I got my doctorate in uh, political economy. Um, I didn't make the mistake Brent did, which is go into uh, higher ed. I decided to, uh, <laughs> decided to pull the ripcord early, went into uh, business research, and so ended up at a company called CEB back in uh, 99 um, and spent almost 20 years there. Um, most of that time spent working with Brent in the customer facing practice. So this was in um, uh, B2B sales, customer experience, customer support. Um, uh, Brent was also spent, I'll let him talk about this, but spent some time uh, in the marketing uh, side of that, uh, that business as well. So after I left uh, CEB, I left shortly after Gardner acquired CEB, uh, spend a year of my life uh, doing uh, management consulting, which I often will say was a year of my life I'll never get back. Um, and then I spent about four years um, at a conversation intelligence company um, on the AI and machine learning space. Um, I've since left, uh, rejoined with a couple of former colleagues uh, who Brent worked with as well, uh, Ted McKenna and Rory Chandler to form DCM Insights uh, earlier this year. Um, so that's that's me. So Brent, over to you. Tell us about uh, tell us about uh, how you kept those kids awake in college. Uh, <laughs> I was actually known as the loud professor. That's one of my students came and said, Brent, no, Professor Adams said, we no. just want you to know we, you're, we think of you as the loud professor. We can hear you all the way down the hall. And it's like, well, that was a bit of a badge of honor. So yeah, I am like actually even more so than that. I'm a defrocked academic. Um, and and there's a long story there, which I won't bore anyone with. But the, the one that actually, Aaron, it's actually kind of interesting because I know you geek out on this kind of stuff too, that, that I would say around this is um, for better or for worse, Matt and I are professional trained researchers, if, if you will, at the highest level. I mean, this is literally when you go to get a PhD, you are, there's a, there's a whole boot camp of just awfulness that you have to go through to become at this level, to do this level of research. And I don't say that for bragging rights. I say that because actually it's kind of important for the work that we do, because sometimes we'll get dinged for, hey, you guys are just researchers. You're not the people who've been selling for the last 20 to 30 years. And, and I think it's actually kind of interesting. It, it leads to this broader debate about society and where we think knowledge comes from, what we think is important and who we believe, which we won't touch on today. But I would be the first to tell anyone, look, I value deeply the experience and the knowledge of someone that's been out there selling or marketing or whatever it might be for their entire career and the richness of the experience is why we spend all our time talking to these individuals and working with them. And um, But I also simultaneously put a lot of value on on research, on doing the modeling and the hard work of data and analytics and and uh, quantitative or qualitative work as well. So I think there's room for both. And I say that only because sometimes we, we get that, Matt knows what exactly I'm talking about, we'll get the things like, what do you guys know? And it's like, well, we know things because there's a system that you can apply to this around knowledge right, creation right. that that I think is valuable. So that's, but I think it's that's the that's the world that we come out of, the perspective that we mm -hmm. come out of is, is um, period. Okay, cool. Well, try saying that you're a sales trainer. Imagine the sort of feedback you get there it becomes even more. Oh no, no, there's there's one word for sales trainer, Aaron, and that is the word corporate. That's all you are, you're just you're just corporate. Oh, by the way, I, I would add real quick. So since departing Gartner, was so CB came corporate executive board became CB became Gartner. I departed Gartner um, in May. I am now uh, at a company called Ecosystems. It's Ecosystems.us. Uh, so I live and breathe now in this really fascinating world. I mean, so interesting around this world of value. So how do we help our customers, our partners understand the value of what they're trying to do, the outcomes they're trying to achieve, um, and then putting KPIs, metrics, targets against that, and then working towards those objectives over time. It's a SaaS platform, it's called Ecosystems. Uh, I'll just put that there, um, but it's 
Matt will tell you a lot of a lot of the work Matt's doing now in Jolt is um, in the Jolt effect with Ted is it's the, it's funny Matt how a lot of everything we do is it seems to keep coming back to these very basic questions of like do you yeah. even know what you're trying to accomplish do you understand how to put some sort of value against that that kind of effort and yeah. how will you it's like what are you trying to do how will you know when you get there that's this I, I boil it down to that what are you trying to do how will you know when you get there uh and and we've been profiling best practices for 30 years around those companies doing that and in an analog fashion I now live in a world where we do that digitally or with software it's super cool yeah, the work you're yeah. doing is fascinating, actually. In fact, the work both you do now is fascinating outside of, obviously, the, the kind of challenger stuff that you, you guys did as well. So look, let's jump into the first question. Let's kick this off. So before we do, guys, if you have any pertinent questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Either I'll interrupt them both and we can we can ask one of those questions or we can leave it to the end, depending on how pertinent the question is. So before we start looking at the future of selling, let's start with some degree of diagnosis, right? So let's talk about some facts. Now, it was a study that came out recently. I can't remember for the life of me who it was, but... Feedback from buyers were that 93% of them said salespeople weren't listening to them during their process of, of, of buying. The second statistic is 53% of opportunities are ending in no decision. So that's not someone choosing a competitor, that's them deciding to do absolutely nothing. The last one, which is really interesting, is that the, the, the feedback from the marketplace is that buyers are finding it difficult to discern signals from white noise, or, or sometimes actually signals from signals. It's not like looking for a needle in a haystack, it's like looking for a specific needle in a needle stack. So how did we get in this position? Uh, Brett, let's kick off with you. What, what, how have we got into the position we are now with modern selling? Okay, cool. Yeah, I will. Uh, real quick, if I may, just a point of order on the operations of this call. So I've got the Q&A up on this screen over here. And by the way, it's like a family reunion. So, so can I just take a moment and say hi to a lot of people we love dearly yeah, yeah. and know very, and, and also to already apologize because I've apparently offended Olivia Lockwood when I said that trainers are corporate. You're not corporate, <laughs> Olivia. I, I'm not saying so that's also, what I think. You also offended Aaron, so that's cool. <laughs> no, no, I just basically made everybody mad know. already. So I, I'm not suggesting that's what I think, but but anyway, yeah. but that's okay. All right, so, so there's this really interesting Interesting phenomenon around information and content. I think there's a number of different dimensions along which customers are overwhelmed today and struggle to feel confident making decisions to go forward, even when they've departed from the status quo. This is Matt's argument in Schultz Effect. It's like, look, I know I need to change. I need, I know I need to move forward. I'm not embracing the status quo, but that doesn't mean I necessarily know how or when or why, or I don't know how to move forward. I don't have the confidence to do that. Um, in my mind, there's three forces eroding customer confidence. One is decision complexity. One is value opacity. And then the third one, which is what you're asking about, Aaron, is information um, overload. And I think the information overload story is really interesting because this is when we get to talk about marketing as well, is that if you think about when Challenger was written 10 years ago, roughly, uh, it was a world, and Matt would agree, of there was certainly an information story there where customers were learning on their own. They were doing their due diligence yep. through digital, thus delaying the engagement of a sales rep. But that story back then was largely a story of separating signal from noise, right? It's like, I go to do my own due diligence to figure out what I believe so that when I come to the rep, they won't trick me into believing something else because now I know what I believe. But over the course of the last 10 years, as everyone's put their thumb on the scale of, I want to be not just a challenger, but irrespective of our work, I want to be a thought leader. Because every freaking CEO in the world has said, we need to be a thought leader in our industry. We need to demonstrate to the market that we're better, we're different, we're smarter, so they come to us first. And right around 2015, as we all remember, content marketing became an actual strategy. The production and deployment of content became a very deliberate strategy of marketing. Right about the time, you know, Scott Brinker's great diagram of like inter Martech stage left, where like thousands of different mar technology tools to allow you to do that at scale. Now we've got better data, we've got better experts. All that means is it's not just the volume of content and information exploded, but frankly, the quality of that content has gone up remarkably quickly as well. Now, I call it the smartness arms race. Where that leaves customers, though, is really interesting. So in our smartness arms race to be the thought leader, which, by the way, becomes harder and harder as everyone gets on the same train. So it's now a commoditized strategy of differentiation, ironically. Um, the, the downside for your customers is, is that it becomes that much more difficult to separate signal from noise when it's all signal. I love your bit, Aaron, about it's a needle in a needle stack. That's just fabulous, right? It's, although it's out, but it's daunting from a customer because... You know, Aaron, you may tell me to zig and you've got data and you've got uh, you've got customer insight or commercial insight. You, you're a challenger organization. I literally, once someone someone once told me in Palo before the 
pandemic hit, it's like, Brent, I just, I did what you told me to do. I don't know about when you hear this, it's like, oh God, what happens now? It's like, I did what you told me to do. I wrote a commercial insight. I'm out there at the whole- no, I, Brent, I usually say you did what Brent told you to do. You do what <laughs> That's why I hate you, Matt. But it's like, but like, but he said, he said like the whole industry is out there telling our customers to zig. We're out there telling our customers to zag. We're a challenger. And I say, but think about it from your customer's perspective. You're not necessarily wrong. You are differentiated in your message, but if they've got data, you've got data, you've, they've got evidence, you've got evidence from your customer's perspective. Now I'm just overwhelmed. I, I, I'm just confused at a higher level, right? So, yeah. so I'll, I'll take a breath there, but I think that's where we are today. And it's very different than 10 years ago is we have high quantities of high quality information, which, so leaving your customer say, I really don't want to talk to a rep now because I got to figure all this out. But as they try to figure it out, they just become that much more confused and everything just kind of breaks. Do you think yeah. Charlie added to the problem? Say that again. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Do you think Challenger added to the problem? I, oh, I, you know, oh, probably. I, so look, oh, probably. I, I, we, we break <laughs> stuff all the time. I don't, Matt, what do you think? I, I, this is a little bit like, so my personal view is, um, so so maybe I think, um, I I think the, the reality is a little bit like we didn't create the internet. And I think the internet, like the, the abundance of information, customers learning on their own has been happening for a really long time. Challenger may have contributed to a spike in the smart, you know, in the creation of the smartness arms race, the advent of content marketing. I think what Brent's saying is absolutely spot on. And so, but I think a lot of these things were happening irrespective of Challenger. Um, I think what's interesting, uh, Aaron, is if you go back to some of those things you mentioned before that in what um, I had not seen that data point, actually, the that 93% of customers feel like, you know, reps are talking past them. But, you know, if I, I was just reflecting on what Brent's saying here, and, and I think there's a couple of really interesting things um, uh, just to piggyback on what he's saying. I think the first is that, you know, Brent and I haven't worked together for a while, but what's so interesting is we've been on these kind of parallel paths and we're finding a lot of the same things. And Brent, you and I, I remember back when we, when we stumbled upon this, the customer's need for insight, their desire for insight, you know, in a world where they can learn on their own, what they want is the thing they couldn't learn on their own. And we, we surfaced that in multiple different studies. Um, and it just kept kind of kept, coming back and confirming this, which made us feel good about what we'd come across. And, you know, when I read what Brent is putting out there and listen to his podcasts and webinars, and I'm like, wow, that's very similar to what we're finding as well. It really does lend this validation that we're, we're onto some big stuff here and some big buying problems. Now, if I go, you know, if I go all the way back to when we started with the, the Challenger sale, it's that research we started in like 08, 09, maybe you could argue even before that, um, the book didn't come out till 2011. Um, we then went on, did the Challenger customer, um, and then a lot of what Brent and I are working on now is around uh, this idea of you know helping customers not just uh, selling to them but buying for them, right? Help, not just helping them to uh, um, uh, to buy but helping them to decide, uh, and that seems to be the new frontier and really where the future is going from an enablement perspective, a a skill development perspective, a sales engagement perspective. Um, but if you go all the way back, you know, Brent hit on this, but this problem that Challenger was really about was this problem of customers learning on their own. What do we do in a world where customers can learn on their own and they want to box you out and force, they treat you the same as your competitors and force you to compete on price. So we went out and we found out that the best salespeople um, bring the thing that uh, the customer couldn't learn on their own. They challenge the customer's thinking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that creates kind of knock-on implications or the next problem people ask said, well, that's really great. But this feels like it, you know, there's another problem here. If I go and I challenge the customer's thinking, now that customer's got to get all their colleagues on board. And we get in this problem of trying to herd cats, dogs, and bicycles. And so I said, all right, well, we went out and did more research on that. And we, we wrote the Challenger customer, which was the story of mobilizers and how do you forge consensus where left to their own devices, buying groups will agree on lowest common denominator stuff. I think now where we're, we're emerging is this world, um, you know, as Brand said, we're, we're shifting from, you know, helping customers buy to now helping them to decide. And there's a, a few, if you will, kind of genies that ha can't be put back in the bottle. I think one of them is this information overload problem. Um, it's just getting worse. It's going to be worse tomorrow than it is today. Um, and customers are bombarded, overwhelmed with the amount of information at their fingertips to evaluate any manner of, of purchase decision. Um, the other is the number of options that, that every vendor puts in front of its customers. So in our research, we call these valuation problems, but the um, it comes down to you know it's not just it's not just our platform, but all the configurations of our platform, all the partner integrations, all the um, the bells and whistles, all the different uh, you know contract lengths and uh, variants of our 
our package, the premium version, the basic version, the standard version, you name it. Yeah. Um, it's all the stuff on our roadmap. And you know, it all looks great to our customer. We don't, it's like going to like a restaurant that has a like 40 items on the menu and it all looks awesome. They don't, there's nothing on there that's purposefully bad, right? It's all good, but you're looking at it and you can't figure out in the world where it all looks good, what should I pick? Cause you don't want to pick the wrong thing, right? Yeah. Um, and then the last thing, um, you know, we've talked about is this idea of outcome uncertainty, which is an area that ecosystems really helps with, which is um, helping customers overcome that fear that they might be left holding the bag, you know, I might buy too much software. I might be buy too many licenses. I might sign up for an ROI or predicate my business case on an ROI that maybe we can't deliver. Maybe it's not you, it's us. Like we just can't get out of our own way. But how do I know that when the ink is dry in the contract, I'm actually getting the value out of this purchase? Because, you know, if I don't, it's going to make me look like a fool, best case. And it could get me fired, worst case, right? I, I wasted the company's money and resources on an investment that didn't pan out. Um, one of the things you, you've talked about is, you know, early on that, that data point, again, that I wasn't familiar with, that 93% of customers feel like the salesperson's not, not listening to them or they're, you know, they're not being heard by the salesperson. And one of the surprising things we found is, and I think it really validates what you're talking about here, is you know, um, when customers go through the purchase journey and they go from you know, their status quo to saying, yeah, we want to move forward, you are the chosen vendor, let's, let's move forward. And inevitably in sales, what the customer starts doing is backpedaling and waffling and wavering and getting cold feet. And what ends up happening in that situation, because salespeople have been taught to do this, is the salesperson goes back and dials up the FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. You know, you, you got, you, you're going to miss out on this golden opportunity to solve this business problem or get after this growth opportunity or mitigate this risk in some new and different way. Um, did you, you know, you're not going to be able to take advantage of these awesome features and benefits. You must not have heard us when I told you how awesome our platform is. Let me show you again. Or like, if you don't sign up now, you're going to miss this 10% discount or this, you know, inventory that is, is suddenly going to be sold to somebody else and you're going to have to wait forever to get your, your delivery if you don't buy now. And what ends up happening is that actually makes things worse, not better, because in this world where customers need help deciding, they're not worried about FOMO. In fact, in our research, we found that most sellers go back to the well and they hammer all those things because they feel like the customer's still in the grips of the status quo. So I got to dial up the FOMO, uh, the fear of missing out but it backfires massively in most of the time. And the reason is the customer is not worried about the fear of missing out. They're worried about uh, their fear is of messing up, not missing out. So they're worried about picking the wrong thing, or I haven't done all the research um, as Brent's talking about, or I, I, I didn't, I don't have any assurance that I'm not going to be left holding the bag. This, this thing might not deliver the value we anticipate. And then I'm going to have egg on my face. I might get fired. And all that stuff is on a secular trend upward. And I think in the next two years, it's going to get a lot worse um, just with the downturn and so much scrutiny on big purchase decisions, risky, disruptive change. It's really interesting. And I love the way that's detailed in the book as well. First of all, the, the, the clear distinction between um, the sticking with the status quo and actually fear of risk. But that statistic jumped out to me that if you go back to the prospect and start almost continue to sell it, that that chance of indecision actually jumps up to about 85%. Is that right? Is that as the statistic? Yeah, it, it, we actually found it's it you have a higher probability when doing that with a customer who's actually not struggling with any kind of preference for the status quo. They're not feeling the FOMO, they're feeling the FOMO, the fear of messing up, messing up. Yeah. And when you go back, it, it, you know what? That wasn't me, Brett. That was somebody much younger than me who came up oh, with that. <laughs> Dude, you know I'm not cool enough to come up with that. <laughs> That's <laughs> really clever. Um, so, it, but it's it's it. When I was thinking about that, Aaron, you said like 93% of customers feel like they're not being heard. I mean, imagine if you are a customer who's like, you know, Brent's selling to me, and I'm saying, Brent, I'm with you. Like the status quo stinks. I want to move forward with with your solution. Let's talk turkey. Let's let's get to a deal. Let's start structuring the contract. And then I start getting cold feet. And what I'm worried about is that I pick, he put a bunch of stuff in front of me and I picked a configuration. I'm not hundred percent sure that's the right one for us. Uh, maybe I overbought, maybe I underbought. I don't, I don't know. Have I done enough research? Like there's so much content out there and I'm a newbie in this space. Like I just don't feel like I'm educated enough. And Brent, let's say he knows way more than I do. And lastly, like there's no safety net here. I, I like these ROI projections are awesome. And I made the business case to CFO and she signed off on it, but I'm going to look like an idiot if it doesn't come through and the salesperson comes back and says, yeah, you know, you're going to miss this 10% discount window. Or did you know, like all your competitors are gapping in the market. It like, it comes across as tone deaf to the customer who's not really worried about any of that stuff. They move past that and they're worrying about something else at this point. Well, I guess it, it, it's probably the salesperson can actually create more fit for that simple reason. Well, well so, yeah. yeah, Aaron, fear, so yeah. 
we, we there, there's, 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 question, there's some, We've only just there's some interesting the dynamics. Let, let me jump because there's some interesting dynamics here. So, so think about this. So, um, first of all, Edward in the Q and A has made a really good point. He says, "Are you guys really talking about customers buying or customers deciding?" And I think that's a fundamentally important point, which is what we're really yeah. solving for isn't buying. We're solving for decision making, and I think that's the thing that's become so fraught is that it's just really, really hard. Both, by the way, also on the consumer side. Uh, for anyone as a, of us as individuals, and certainly as us as a buying group, to just make a decision that we feel confident in. Here's Aaron, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, Aaron, because it's the world you live in, because I find this really interesting. You would think that this is our moment in sales. If there was ever a time where there is a moment for us in the profession of sales, this would be it. Because effectively, what we're describing is a situation where our customers are crying out for help at least figuratively, yeah. right? It's like, I am overwhelmed. I don't have confidence. I don't know what to do, or at least I'm confused. You know what I really need, Aaron? I need someone to help me. And then the sales rep says, dun, 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 I'm here. It's like, oh no, not you. It's <laughs> anyone but you, right? It's like, what, a, what, a, what a, a bummer that we live in a moment where our target audience, i.e. customers, is begging for our help, and yet they reject our help because of the, 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 the brand around our profession, our past behavior, um, but I do think for the ones who do this right, this kind of is our moment. Because the other thing, one of the really interesting things we were doing at Gartner right before I left is this a whole body of research showing pretty definitively that customers left to their own devices, the ones that say, the ones that eschew, there's a nice word, eschew a sales rep, say, I don't want to talk to a sales rep, I'll do this on my own, actually wind up feeling even worse. So, yeah. so there's, a, I need help. I want help. I'm open to help. I need help specifically around deciding, not buying. And I need help around these dimensions that will make me feel more confident in our ability to make big decisions on behalf of our company. Um, but if you, if so, if you, but you, I think here's the thing: if you're a sales professional in this environment and you're going to raise your hand and say, "I'll help," you better not be the one that comes in and makes it worse. Because if you come in and make it worse, uh, bad things are going to happen, not just for you, but for your for your company, for your colleagues, and and for the customer. And what's really interesting is where this all gets you. Because at the end of the day, this isn't a story about buying or deciding. This is a story about human. This is a story about humans. It's how we are as human beings and how we're interacting with our world today. And at the end of the day, you know who feels like garbage is your customer. Not about they don't hate you. They hate themselves. It's like this is you know me on Amazon trying to buy a fifteen dollar dongle for my computer and spending four <laughs> hours reading reviews because this one got a four point two and that one got a four point five and, and they're in the all morning, still I sitting find... in your shopping cart. <laughs> well, that's just it. At the end of the night, at two hours of studying, it's like I get really frustrated and click save for later, and it just goes off into the ether, and I defer the decision, and I just kind of hate myself for just spending two hours on a freaking fifteen dollar dongle. Right now, multiply that by a couple of orders of magnitude, and you got B two B buying today. And if a sales rep comes in and makes that worse then bleep you. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't got time for that. And now I hate me and I hate you for making me hate me. Do you know what I'm saying? Which gets into this really interesting Cialdini stuff around Robert Cialdini's book, Influence. If you haven't read it, you got it, right? Is I, but is this idea of a value exchange and a value exchange can work in both directions, right? In other words, if you feel, if you give me something of value and something of value could be like a solution, sure, but something of value could be I feel better about myself. This is how relationships work, like like friendships and, and dating, right? It's like, when I'm around you, I feel better about myself. I feel more confident in myself. That's our opportunity as sales professionals today is not to change the way our customers think about us, but to change the way customers think about themselves. That's what gets yeah, me excited. I, I said earlier, before you joined, Brent, I was like, this is, you talked to both of us before, so we'll have time for exactly one question, which we'll answer in 58 parts. <laughs> so, I'm let me, I'm going to add truth. one more thing. Well, yeah, I think let's, it's so, let's, let's so interesting. Focus, sorry, let's just turn our focus a little bit, right? Sure. We, yeah, we spend a lot of time on the diagnosis and a lot of people have, have turned up yeah. to what the future looks like, right? So mm -hmm. let, let me ask you a question. I think you touched on a couple of these points already, but and again, guys, thanks so much for the questions that are coming through. I think a lot of them are going to be answered as we start answering some of these questions, but we'll make time at the end to answer them as well. So what what do you perceive that buyer experience looking like in the future right now just just to, to add some color to this i think the buyer's voice or the customer's voice is probably a the right way of putting it is lost sometimes in the noise of internal processes and sales people and sales organizations looking inwards and again we've got to appreciate that sales is, a, is an interesting industry where the inputs are actually counterintuitive to the outputs that you want so it's all very us focused versus customer focused so get send out 100 proposals versus how many people have asked me for a proposal today, which is a customer-led action. So what do you perceive the, the buyer experience to look like in the future? Like, What's the buyer demanding that's going to shape the way? 
I, I would, so I'll throw something out there. I know Brent's going to jump in too. So, um, uh, and then we will have time for one more question after that. So the, um, I, I think if at the highest level, I really do, I'm struck by, you know, Brent, I've had recent conversations about this, but this shift from selling to customers to help, you know, how do we shift from selling to them to, you know, helping them make decisions? So it's still that self-efficacy, that confidence that they can do this. They're making a great decision. They're working with an expert who, is going to guide them to making a right decision. They're not going to be left holding the bag. They're going to look like a hero, not like a fool. Um, you know, in, in one of the things we talk about in the book is uh, the shift from selling to our customers to buying for our customers. And that may be overstated a little bit, but Brent, you guys wrote about a long time ago, and I love this analogy. It's so perfect uh, for the world we're in, is salesperson shifting from, uh, you know, sale, the salesperson's main goal is to, Break that, you know, gravitational pull of the status quo. Get the, you know, dial up the FOMO. Um, get, you know, sell to the customer to becoming more of a like a travel agent to the customer in this world where they're overwhelmed. I want to, you know, if I'm going to a place I've never been before, I want to work with somebody who's been there before, who knows way more than I do about where I'm about to go, who knows where to go, where not to go, how to get there, where to eat, where to stay, what activities to partake in, all these things, and just feel like boy, I am going to look like a hero to my family because we're planning an awesome uh, trip, not go and do all this research on my own. And then every step of the way, be second guessing and backtracking and relitigating my decisions, which makes me feel awful about myself. And, you know, and again, it's, it's all my concern about, did I mess up? Did I make some bad decision here? So I, I think that's, it really is the shift. Now I want to be very clear. I don't, I don't personally believe we, Brent and I used to work for a guy at CB who used to talk about the uh, the tyranny of the or, which is, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, he put a lot of work in front of me and I'd say, well, which one do you want me to do, project do you want me to do, this one or that one? He'd go, do both. <laughs> so that's the tyranny of the or, we got to do both. And so I think as salespeople, you know, the first job is always to beat the status quo. We've got to, the status quo is a very powerful enemy in sales. It always has been, and it can, will continue to be. Um, then we've got to get the customer to see that, uh, moving forward, leaving the status quo, um, uh, that it's suboptimal. Moving forward with us is the right thing to do. We've got to get them to express their intent to want to buy from us. We've got to leave the status quo behind, reach that exit velocity. But after that point, once they've stopped obsessing about the status quo and we've broken their perception that it's good enough, right, and they don't need to change, what creeps into their head is, did I make the right decisions here? Did I buy too much? Did I buy too little? Did I configure this the right way? Have I done enough research? Do I have any assurance from this partner? Do they know what they're doing? Am I going to get the ROI from this solution? It's that fear of messing up that 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 comes in and nature abhors a vacuum. And we do know this from decades of behavioral economics research and human psychology research is the fear of messing up is far more powerful than the, the fear of missing out. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny, I, I had a recent conversation with uh, Dan Pink, who wrote a book called The Power of Regret. I'd recommend it to everyone here. Uh, it's really powerful. And, and it, Dan is 100% right in his argument that, you know, when we look back on our lives and we say, you know, what are our biggest regrets? Invariably, it's the stuff that we didn't do. It's not the stuff that we did do. It's that I didn't ask this person out on a date in college. I didn't go to, I didn't go to Woodstock when I could have, you know, I had a ticket and I decided to stay home and play Dungeons and Dragons instead of going to Woodstock. I, you know, whatever it is, like I didn't, I didn't take that dream job and I could have taken it and it would have been awesome. I didn't study abroad. You know, these are the things we regret, but those things like that regret, we, we perceive when those decisions are long in the rear mirror, those things actually don't help salespeople. That is a powerful uh, factor. Um, those, you know, things that you didn't do and regretting those decisions you didn't make. But right now, this week, this month, this quarter, this fiscal year, when we need our customer to buy something, it's not the fear of missing, it's a fear of messing up that they obsess about. And we've got to help them that with that. We've got to help them decide. We've got to instill that confidence and self-efficacy. So it's not that we need to stop uh, convincing them to leave the status quo. It's that we need to do that and we need to now do this other thing. It's just, unfortunately, the bar for salespeople is going to go up moving forward. I love that analogy about the, uh, about the travel agent. And the idea of curating the information is actually the role of the salesperson now. Is there anything you want to add to that, Brent? Well, Aaron, if I could, the, the it was really interesting because I was answering your question in my head. I, I went a completely different direction, which I imagine at least a number of listeners might do the same thing. We just talk about the future of buying or the I think you asked the future of selling, but let's flip it, the future of buying. Yeah. I think almost automatically, many of us in the commercial discipline would say, so this means more digital, right? In other words, we tend to we tend to lean into the channel 
that is a, a digital channel versus a human channel, whether it's virtual or in person as the way that we need to think. But so less sales reps, more stuff on your website. And that's kind of what I was thinking through too. Um, this is actually where I get kind of frustrated. This is some of the stuff I've written. Uh, you know, this, you know, I didn't title that article in HBR, by the way, about sales and marketing becoming obsolete. I don't know that they're obsolete, but I think they're actually going to be, we're going to be hamstrung by our traditional organizational silos because yeah. many of us tend to think of this like, okay, so more digital, is that what you're saying? Or we, need, and I think the better way to think about this is irrespective of channels. So in other words, this goes for marketers, it goes for heads of sales success, however you choose to engage with your customers, or more importantly, however your customers choose to engage with you, whether it's on your website, through your sales reps, virtually or in person, through a, a third party or a partner, one way or another, I think our objective as a supplier, as a potential partner to our customers needs to be, and this in some ways captures a lot of what Matt's talking about in your question too, Aaron, is, um, is a move from frame breaking, which is largely what Challenger is all about. And I, again, Challenger is not dead. It's not, we're not going to put a fork in it. You don't want to unilaterally disarm in a smartness arms race. That would be, a, hey, we're going to say dumb things now. That's not what I'm suggesting, right? So the, uh, but rather the window of opportunity to differentiate yourself based on saying smart things is narrowed significantly. And so what's the new opportunity? I think that's the move from being frame breaking to frame making. Mm -hmm. And frame making is just, that's our role. That's our opportunity in sales, in marketing, however, and through whichever channel you engage with your customers, how can I help them? How can I create a framework such that they feel more comfortable and confident in making their decisions? So it's kind of like chalking the pitch or chalking the field, taking something that's big and hairy and scoping it down and saying, look, there's a lot of stuff out there. But here's the three things based, and I love the phrase, I, I use it all the time, Any, I, I think I say this in every podcast, but in working with other customers like you, one of the things that we've learned is, because that's our role, our role is to say, here's what I think you should do. Our role is to be Switzerland, to be neutral, more, that's a whole nother story about the history of Switzerland, but let's park that. But there's a, our role is to be a broker of information, a conduit, that's maybe the best word, a conduit of help. So in working, what's the one thing every customer wants to know what other companies like them are doing, but then they'll also tell you that we're totally different. So it's really frustrating. But the, so in working with other customers like you, here's what we're finding is that these three questions matter. These three attributes for this situation, you probably want to think about this way. Now, I don't give you the answer because you've got to come up with your own answer because you've got to feel confident in yourself. So it's got to be your decision, but I can make it easier for you. I can put a framework around it. And there's, again, these three dimensions. I can help put a framework around decision-making. I can help put a framework around information and I can help put a framework around value. It's mm -hmm. like, what's a matter? So, so decision-making is largely the buyer enablement work we've done. The, 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 the framework around information is the sense-making work we've done. And this framework around value is kind of where I live now, but there's probably other dimensions too, but but this idea of frame making, chalking the field, providing a framework for your customers. What, and you could do this through diagnostics. You can do this through uh, calculators. You can do it through conversation. You can do it through graphically. But but I, I think, Aaron, that's uh, you tell me, man. But it's like if you're buying something, you buy stuff all the time, right? It's like whether it's commercially or individually, it's like that's the kind of help I need. It's like just help me boil this down to the stuff that matters most. And then yeah. I will come to my own conclusion. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, look, the the key thing is is something that, that we've been harping on about and selling for a long time now is that actually the role of the salesperson's changed right it's not a salesperson yeah. per se right your your role now is to be a trusted advisor both pre-sale and post-sale right that's that's your role and that thing you just said there was so fascinating and i remember you sharing this with me last time yeah that one that one statement around would you like me to give you some insight in some of the questions that our customers are asking what you're creating is you're you're becoming a conduit between yeah. how, how people have successfully navigated this challenge and overcome it in the past and someone who's sitting there biting their nails really scared of making change and worried about it messing up now that's the role of the salesperson that's what salesperson 2.0 looks like is this sort of like trusted advisor that's giving the insight that they can't get because it's their customers not all this white noise that's going on in the market at the moment super super interesting matt you look like you're a tips person you want to add something so i'll jump over to you yeah no look i mean you're I, Brian was talking about when you're talking about uh, digital before I was thinking uh, so Brian and I've also spent time studying customer service and customer experience and you know one of the biggest transformations in that space is what happened when uh, self-service came about and it's just we all love self-service and what happens is the the easy stuff goes away the transactional stuff goes away and what ends up coming to the the service organization that live service rep is the stuff that customers couldn't do on their own and so I think sales is kind of on a similar march which is you know there was some recent study and I, I'm going to you know, massively misquote this, but there was some research by McKinsey. I know Gartner's done some similar work as well. 
uh, brands around the size of purchases that can be done online, even in a B2B context, right, uh, are going up and up and up. And what's so interesting is you think about in a world where you can actually buy this stuff on your own, you're talking to a salesperson because you couldn't buy it on your own because you need help, actually. You have answering a lot of these questions that Brent's uh, talking about here. And then, Aaron, you, you know, when you talk about this idea of, of trusted advisor, I think the thing that's often missed, and this goes back to your 93% data point you shared early on, it's a trust element. It's, you know, we all want to be an expert and we kind of get that. Um, I want to demonstrate my expertise. I want to show the customer I know more than they, uh, they do. Uh, they're, they're working with somebody who's an expert in the space. That's all well and good. But the trust part is often overlooked. And I think um, it, it's sort of one of these terms that I think means everything but nothing at the same time. But quite literally, you know, when we, we found in our re uh, recent research that we write about that there are moments in the sales process where the salesperson can overcome what's called the principal agent dilemma, which is fundamentally the information asymmetry that exists between a, a customer and a salesperson. The customer comes into the sale believing that the salesperson is incentivized to sell them more than they need, to not share with them the dirty laundry, to not put, you know, point out the things that don't work, right? More is always better. And in, a, in that world, the, there's a fundamental distrust. So you're never going to put yourselves yourself in the hand. If I'm working with a travel agent, back to that metaphor before, who's I think is only motivation to sell me the five-star hotel and the luxury cruise and the things that like my my family and I don't need or an outsider budget. I'm going to go do my own research and make sure I'm making the right decision. I'm not going to fully invest in in letting that person guide the way. And so there are moments in the sale that we all encounter things like quite tactful, tact, tactically telling our customer what they shouldn't buy, right? You don't need the premium version. The standard version is fine for your needs. Um, you don't actually need to roll this out enterprise-wide. In fact, I'd encourage you not to. You should roll it out in a narrow use case first, and then we can expand from there. That's going to be easier for us to get done. It's going to put less pressure on you. Let's get some runs on the board, and then let's expand from there. Mm -hmm. um, even, and think about this, how many of your salespeople will actually proactively tell the customer, based on what you're asking for, I got to tell you, we're actually not the best in the, in the industry uh, for that specific use case or that specific need. These guys are. In fact, I know people over there will put you in touch with them. You know, that, that's like an audacious thing for a salesperson to do. But think about a salesperson who tells you that stuff. Suddenly it's like, oh, you're not trying to oversell me. You are sharing like the dirty laundry. You're telling me what to buy, what not to buy, being a good steward of my budget and my time and resources. So we got to not overlook that piece of it in our, our journey to want to become trusted advisors. But but I, I think you're right. It is a shift from, you know, if you will, salesperson to trusted advisor, or if you will, we call it a buyer's agent, right? It's sort of the, the notion that we're thinking about here. Yeah, I love the way that comes out in the book as well, because it's hyper practical. Some of the stuff that salespeople can just actually start doing as part of their sales process almost immediately. Like literally, even things like, like offer them the middle package or the smaller package if you genuinely believe that's the thing. It's one of the quickest, most effective ways of building trust and demonstrating that you're not in it just to make them a big sale and give, give, give reason behind the recommendation that you're making. I think you use the term expert recommendation, which is great. So... We're going to jump into Aaron, Aaron, let me let me do that. I'm going to flip the script for a second, if I may. So there's Please. a question from Richard. It's, it says Richard Purr, which I'm wondering if it's Richard Perez, our old friend. So if it is, hey, Richard. The, the, uh, <laughs> he asked a really good question, So uh, which is, well, it's a good discussion. We're, we're missing the we, right? Which is like, who's going to help reps get there? Which is, this yeah. is your world, man, right? So it's like, tell what's your take? Because we're talking about, in some ways, very tactical, to, don't do this, do this. But also we're talking about a pretty significant, not just skill set shift, but a mindset shift. How how would a company, not just an individual, but a company, make progress? I mean, do you do you have hope that this can be done, or or and and and, and it can be done practically in a relatively short order, or not? What what's your take on that? Yeah, but again, like anything, it's an organizational capability, right? Is that yeah. first of all that the, the people who are making decisions strategically need to have a deep understanding of sales culture, and so many times you see a disconnect between the. CEO of a business who created a product in their bedroom and now they're like, okay, we need a sales team, go and start selling it. It's like, yeah, it doesn't yeah. work like that. But also as well, I think that if you take something as simple as your sales process, right? The sales process is so often so sales centric. It never brings the customer's voice into it. So looking at indicators that are, that are about the effort that we're putting in and the, and the things we're doing and the tasks we're doing, Great, that's self-serving. And it's always going to do is force the salesperson to do more activities like that. But let's 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 shift the dial a little bit and say, actually, we should be building into our sales process customer-led actions. So stuff the customer's doing to indicate that they're a serious buyer, we can help them, you know, we can actually go in there and intervene when certain things are happening with the right, the right strategies. 
So look, the long answer is, the short answer is we go into businesses all the time. We find the best way of doing it is actually educating the top of the organization and then letting that trickle down to the sales organization. Let, let me, let me, if I could, just a bit, this is school of hard knock stuff, right? I mean, this is years and years of doing this and getting just beat up early on by making the same mistake over and over again. And Matt will know because he's done this too. Um, any story about selling and selling differently, if it is presented to your team, your frontline, particularly as here's a better way to sell, or here's a new way to sell, or here's a way that you should sell differently, um, will automatically create a defensive posture among your sales force. Uh, and, and and again, so like in early days of Challenger, hey, Challenger wins, be a challenger. It's like, who are you, you research geek? Get off the stage. I've got five trophies behind me that say that I'm the best seller in the company. Who are you to tell me what to do? So as as this is why Matt and I both gravitate very strongly because of School of Hard Knocks to not so much studying selling, but studying buying and understanding how buying is evolving because it's evolving dramatically. In fact, I think that's the whole point of this conversation exactly is right. buying is evolving so much faster than selling is evolving. Yeah. And it's creating this increasingly wide gap between the way that we're going to market and the way that our customers are trying to decide. So if I could any, if it, it's unsolicited advice to many of you out there as, as a leader, as an enabled exec, or just as an individual sales professional, Start with the story of how B2B buying is changing and, and focus on the disconnect. So the story to your sellers isn't, hey, start doing this to be good. It's rather, you're great, but if you want to keep being great, here's how you need to adapt to stay relevant in this world, given the fact that that customers are changing. So just school of hard knocks tip there that hopefully yeah, is helpful to some. Yeah. And look back to the back to the point Brett made earlier. I mean, we're not we're we're researchers. We're not Ben. I have all the respect in the world for for salespeople and, and what everyone on the call does, the teams you lead, the organizations you built, um, and what you guys do out in the market every single day. But we're researchers. And, and I think one of the things that we always say about Challenger, and this is true about the new work too, is that we didn't invent this stuff, right? We just went out and studied what we call the lead steer effect, which is the environment, the buying environment, as Brent's talking about, has changed. So, you know, before Challenger, it was a lot of like, go in, find out what's keeping the customer up at night. Well, when the what happens in a world where the customer can kind of do a lot of their research on their own, well, the, the bar goes up. And it turns out the best sell salespeople don't just focus on that. They focus on showing the customer what should be keeping them up at night. They challenge their thinking. We went out and studied that with data, gave language to it, but we didn't invent challengers. The best salespeople in the world invented that approach. We just gave terminology to it. Fast forward to today, you know, in a world where customers are overwhelmed now with information and choice and, and outcome uncertainty and, and all this stuff about to spike in the next couple of years with an expected downturn, you know, what, what do the best salespeople do there? Well, what they do is they, they don't just help the customer, they don't sell to the customer, they help buy for them. They, they help them decide, they help instill that confidence, that self-efficacy, help them navigate uh, become that buyer's agent, right? It, the buying environment has changed and it has cha changed in really substantial ways in the 10 years since we wrote um, Challenger and it will continue to evolve moving forward. So we always have to keep our eyes on what are the, the leaders in the pack doing? Because these folks will figure out how the environment has changed, changed and they will change the way that they sell. And the reason I think to the, it was RP who asked that question, uh, Brett, but uh, I think that the reason that salespeople continue to do this stuff is pretty simple because you, we all tell them to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. So in a world where customers can learn on their own and you keep telling your salespeople, go out and find out what's keeping the customer up at night, don't be surprised when that doesn't pan out as well as it once did. In a world where customers are overwhelmed with all this information and choice and outcome uncertainty, and you're telling them, no, 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 just dial up the FOMO, create the burning platform. Don't be surprised when it backfires on you because the customer's no longer concerned with that. And they're looking for a different kind of sales experience. Your best salespeople will figure it out on their own and they have figured it out on their own. And that's kind of what our job is to look at the environment and then figure out what the leaders of the pack have have done to adapt their approach. So there's a there's a, there's a few questions that are coming through, and I think I'm willing into this question now. Is that back when you guys wrote the Challenger Cell, I think it was you said 2007, and the research started 2008. Obviously, that was right at the peak of the global financial crisis, right? So you're talking about an outside influence on our yeah. sector, or market, or industry, that's starting to shape the way that the the two key parties interact. What, what do you think is the biggest outside influence on selling, <clears throat> whatever that may be, that's actually going to shape the future of selling? What, what's the big iceberg in the distance or pocket of opportunity or pot of gold in the distance for sales organizations and, and salespeople in general? Mm. So, Matt, I'd, I'd love to get... 
I'm taking note, but no, I, honestly, because this is where I struggle. I mean, I struggle at Gartner too is, and so Matt, because you've lived in the world of AI and there's a couple of questions on it too. I think that is one, at least the potential major disruptors uh, in, in not just the world of sales with commercial and decision-making. Yep. Um, and, and Matt, because you lived, you know, in the AI world for so long at Tether, it, it, I, I don't know, is this a, does it like change things in the margins? Does it completely rewrite the industry or, or not the industry, but the profession? I, I, that's one of the places where I dig in first and a couple of people and ask about it. I'd love to get your thoughts on it, Matt. You know, I, I don't, I, so I, where I was going to go, Aaron was more uh, kind of where Brent went before on it's digital continuing to, to pick off the, the more, you know, what was once complex and you had to talk to a salesperson, there's no way you could buy without is suddenly something you can buy online. Yeah. You can do all your research, you buy online that makes the, the, the complexity and the, the stuff that the salesperson needs to get involved in is the stuff the customer can't buy on their own. Mm -hmm. And so that ups the bar for salespeople. I think all the information out there, all the choices, like look at any of these, Brent, you mentioned like the like the MarTech landscape. Like if I think about like the sales tech lack stack landscape, we've all seen those like eye charts with the gazillion logos of like, mm -hmm. I mean, it, like startups coming out of the woodwork in every single space, like the amount of choice out there in options, which are many of, uh, you know, the vast majority of which are great options. It's just so hard to navigate this stuff. And look, every vendor that we're talking to is uh, trying to move up the value chain. You might start by selling something cheap and transactional, just kind of drive a wedge in the market and grab your share. But you're very quickly trying to move from selling a product to selling a solution. And it's it's upping the price point. It's increasing the risk. It's that you're going from a, you know, buy and tr try and buy and like, you know, uh, you can cancel any time to like three, five year contract, which are really expensive for your customers. That increases and amps up that outcome uncertainty where the customer really starts to wring their hands and say, gosh, this is not a, no longer just something I can buy and try it out. It's something that's like a bet the farm badge on the table decision. I could get in a lot of trouble if this goes south. So like those, those things I think are, are changing the dynamic, but I think to Brent's question about AI, you know, look, I don't, um, my, uh, so my personal view here is, and I think in a world of complexity um, and uh, where, again, the bar for sellers going up, the, the things we're going to have to, the, the decisions we're trying to help our customers make, you know, dealing with that fear of messing up, not just the fear of messing out, navigating all that information, dealing with a customer who couldn't buy on their own and now needs to talk to somebody uh, who can help them buy. Um, that is stuff that people do. Uh, and I don't know that that's a world that machines, like the machines take over and they start doing it for us. I've always thought of AI and machine learning as sort of like Jarvis to Iron Man, uh, uh, excuse the pop culture reference, but it's it's not it's not taking over the job of the salesperson, but can be a very powerful complement to help the salesperson. I, I look at that as well from a research standpoint. I, I've always, what I'm fascinated by is, and Aaron, you and I have talked about this, but the like the Moore's law of research, um, uh, sales research, you know, look at like what Neil Rackham did back in the late 70s, 80s, 10 years, 12 people, 30 something thousand sales calls they physically sat in on, a lot of resource and a lot of money spent sitting on 30,000 sales calls. Fast forward to the challenger sale, much bigger data set, um, much shorter time to insight. Fast forward to the jolt effect, we looked at two and a half million calls and it was myself, Ted, and like our data scientists part time getting from like start to finish on that study. And I don't know what it'll be next, but I do know that the power of like compute power and uh, machine learning helps us get much deeper insight into unstructured data and surface things that we could never surface before. It's a little bit like, you know, some of these things are new, but some of these things were always out there. And we just now have like, what is it? The web telescope, the one that they shot way past the moon. It's like getting these pictures of the universe that it was always there, but we never had that perspective before. Um, so I, I think as a, as a researcher, I think this is a fascinating time. In terms of its impact on sales, I think it's probably more, at least for the foreseeable future, it's like a, it's a complement to sellers. It can be a powerful ally, but it's not really a replacement for uh, for a human being helping customers deal with these really, really tricky, difficult decisions. There, there is a time, Aaron, where, you know, going for this gets super interesting, but it's, it feels like sci-fi and it's not. But where, for example, my refrigerator orders milk from Amazon or wherever it might be, <laughs> and it just shows up and there was no humans involved at all where bots are buying from bots. And my my good friend Don Scheibenreif over at Gartner talks a lot about this. Um, and it's a super interesting world. And I think I, I think the more transactional stuff will eventually get there because why why wouldn't you do that, right? So I think the, the thing that comes out in, in a lot of my thinking and research on this has come out in this conversation today is 
where we are differentiated as a sales profession is around those elements where humanity becomes a critical part of a decision, right? So, and you, by humanity, like just not just being empathetic and a good, compassionate person, which is all great and important, but things like the human biases that Matt spends a lot of time and Ted talk about in the Jolt Effect, for example, it's understanding, you know, the, the thing that it's like I, I told Matt the other day, it's like, you know, our customers are struggling to decide today, not because of the economy. Our customers are struggling to decide today because of their humanity, because they get trapped yeah. into these yeah. these decision stalls around, you know, all the uh, around overwhelmedness and, and lack of confidence and uh, and then all the biases kick in. And so I think if we think about the future of the sales profession, Noel, there you go, this is the person, the individual, the human, I think. Our role in some ways, it's, and Dave Brock made this point as part of the discussion a little bit ago. It's like, aren't we just talking about stuff that's been around forever? In some ways we are, right? It's like, the, the, what's, it's like what old, what's old is new again around, it's the humanity, it's the human element. It's trusted advisor is a term that's been around since long before Challenger. It was around when I got into this profession 20 years ago and some great work done there. It's just the trusted advisor is like this empty vessel. It's like, what do you, every time Matt will tell you that we came up with a new idea and research, someone said, oh, you mean trusted advisor. And then we'd say something completely different. And someone would say, oh, you mean trusted advisor. So it's like, so, so yes, be a trusted, but what is the basis of trust in this world? What is it? What is the, what does advice look like? Those, those are the thing we'd say, yes, solve for trusted advisor, but, but how do you build trust? And what does advice look like? And that's, that's where I think that's, what's going to evolve. But I think we're going to come back more and more to this very human connection because the stuff that we can transact digitally, we're going to transact digitally mm. where we get algorithms talking to algorithms, but, but, but even online for the marketers listening, just because you're working through a digital channel doesn't mean there's no human element. So because it's yeah. humans, so you've got human customers interacting with your digital experience, that digital experience needs to be built in such a way to be frame making, to be confidence creating, to, to be a trusted advisor website. Uh, and so, so there's a lot to think about in terms of the future of technologies and AI and how that and algorithms and bots and all that stuff. But I think the thing that we all individually and collectively on this call can focus on is, is the human element that in some ways doesn't change, but in some ways evolves dramatically in the yeah. next few I, years. There, I, this reminds me of what Brent's saying, reminds me of a famous quote from uh, Amos uh, Tversky, who's um, uh, Daniel Kahneman's longtime collaborator since passed away. Um, uh, one of the co-founders or co-creators of prospect theory and lost the whole idea of loss of virgin, one of the forefathers of behavioral economics was asked at a conference, before, certainly before his passing, um, what do you think about artificial intelligence? And he said, I, I don't know, we study natural human stupidity, not artificial intelligence, or <laughs> natural stupidity, not artificial intelligence. So that's kind of where we are. Yeah, that's what we start to do. So we're possibly running out of time, but I, I actually want to get a soundbite from you both, because I think it's going to be useful and actionable for people in the room now. But with what you know, and obviously with the, the multitude of things that we've discussed today, and the depth that you've gone in it, if you were in a room with a CEO at the moment who's talking about sales and how they want to improve their sales organization, or are you with a sales enablement leader, uh, or even with you with a head of sales, what would be the, the one piece of advice? I know this is a very typical webinar to end like this, but I think it's an important one. What would be the one piece of advice on everything that we've gone through today that you think is going to move the needle and how they approach the market and actually enable their buyers to buy? Um, one, I'll, um, maybe I'll start here and then uh, we go to Brent, but the, um, I think there's, there's this interesting thing, uh, Dave, Dave Brock, who's uh, I know on the, uh, the call said this um, a while ago, and I think he's right. And there's a lot of focus right now, you know, we've all, we've equipped all of our salespeople with spam cannons. And like if, if Aaron, you and I, I think talked about this recently on LinkedIn, but if your LinkedIn inbox, anything like mine, like it's a lot of empty outreaches about stuff that I have, would never buy in a gazillion years. <laughs> And certainly not buy from you when your your invite was like, hey, I'm from this company, I'd like to sell you this thing. So you know, it's so there's we're on this war to like try to engage customers and try to get those visits and get you know start the sales process and get that get that first meeting, get calendar time, etc. But it's um, it's a it's a weird uh, it's a weird thing that you know when we study what's going on in sales, you know, 40 to 60 percent of your deals are lost to no decision. They're actually already in your pipeline. So it's not about driving, you know, that top line. I'm not saying ignore lead gen and demand gen, but let's focus on the 40 to 60 percent of deals that could be, you know, spurred into action and you could move some of those toward a decision. That's the that's the big productivity lever. Um, I think a tactical piece of advice. Here's one thing, because I, I I was asked this literally just yesterday. What's like there's a lot of stuff that you know in the recent research, what's the one thing you say we should do? Um, is just stop when your customer, 
waivers in waffles and backpedals and what you've been taught as a seller to do, and this has been passed on from leader to manager to rep for generations now, is go out and dial up the FOMO, create the burning platform, you know, break out your beat the status quo hammer, stop for a moment and think about what might be giving the customer cold feet. It might actually be they're totally bought in and moving forward. It might be that they're struggling with, is it configuration A, B, or C? It might be that they just don't feel like they've done enough research yet. They want to talk to somebody else. They want to, you know, read the the, the next Gardner report that comes out. They they want to they want to um, talk to more of your product folks. It might be that they just feel like, gosh, this is a really big decision. Like this is if this goes wrong, I'm going to look like a clown, you know, or I'm going to I could get fired, right? Those are more often in our research we found those are more often the things that that give people cold feet. It's not their fear of missing out. So. And, and again, the knee-jerk reaction, because sellers have been taught to do this for so long, is just dial up the FOMO. But as we talked about earlier, it can really increase your odds of making it worse. You're actually statistically better off doing nothing in that situation than you are just busting out that, that beat the status quo hammer. So I, my advice is just take a breath, pause, and think about what's really giving your customer cold feet. I love that. And I, lo- I love how that comes out in the book as well. And for anyone on the call, I fully recommend when it launches getting a copy of the Jart Effect because there's so much actionable insight out of that. And it really changes the way you think about customer decision. Brent, over to you. The um, So a couple of just a couple of housekeeping items in, in, in the um, Q&A. So one, I'm not drinking Jack Daniels. It's iced tea. Jack Daniels doesn't kick <laughs> until, until lunchtime. Um, and then oh, second, the best... Later. The, the best sales book I would write. That's not for another hour. Uh, also, the best Brent's sales a book, tequila guy. He's not a Jack Daniels guy. I know this. I don't, so. I don't like to talk about that. But anyway, the uh, uh, the best sales book, anything by Steinbeck, I would start with Grapes of Wrath. Um, because I think, again, if we're talking, and I mean that, that sounds like a tongue-in-cheek line, but I actually mean that sincerely. If we're talking about the human element of sales, I'd start with books that dive deep into humanity. And mm-hmm. and I can't think of a better place to start than anything by Steinbeck. So and so that seems like a line, but I actually mean that sincerely. Um, that okay. Uh, so so Aaron, if you put me in front of a CEO, I'm going to shoot for the moon, and that's why. And I'm going to fail five times out of seven or whatever. So because I'm only most interested in talking to the most progressive CEOs who are willing to do something radically different, because I think that's where we are right now. So if I'm talking to CEO, the first thing I'm going to say is. I think we need to put everything that we do with our customers through the lens of customer confidence, but it's not customer's confidence in you, your brand, your product, your salespeople, it's customer's confidence in themselves and their ability to make uh, large scale decisions on behalf of their company. And we need to do that across every single function. In fact, so Jay made the point in the, com- in the comments about it's marketing. So let's take the best of marketing and the best of sales and smash them together. I think what happens is we get the worst of both worlds rather than the best. I think the thing we have to do, and there's very few companies out there brave enough to do this right now. And that's why I wrote about smart technologies and HBR because they're doing this is to dismantle the whole thing. And I, yes, I know I did like that's it's somewhat open. I, I tell you it's radical, except I've literally seen companies do this, right? Go to first principles and ask yourself, if we were to take the entire legacy org structure and just set it over here and with a clean sheet of paper, ask what would, how would we create an organization? How would we organize? Uh, if we were to simply say our job our, our goal is to solve for customer buying jobs. What are the jobs that customers have to complete to their satisfaction in order to feel confident to make progress and ultimately make a decision on behalf of their company and then build up from that? And yeah. that may, be, it's probably not going to, I think our, the single biggest obstacle most of us have for breakout growth in the next five years is our own legacy silos. And that's going to be really interesting to watch because there's going to be very few, very progressive companies that embrace that and break the whole thing down and rebuild something else. And so that, again, you ask CEO quite, that's the CEO conversation. That's not the sales yeah. rep conversation. That's not the sales enablement conversation. Yeah. That's not even the sales leader conversation, but that is the CEO conversation. Love that. Brilliant. Well, fantastic. Well, guys, look. I think we're going to sign off now. I'm going to give you a chance to sign off and, and talk about some of the work that you're doing. But before we go, if you like the content we've done today and you want to see more webinars, feel free to follow the uh, Flow State LinkedIn page and obviously give me a follow on LinkedIn as well. Brent, we'll actually start with you. Why don't you uh, let people know how they can find you and any projects that you're working on at the moment? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm now again with a company called Ecosystems. It's ecosystems.us. We have built uh, a, a very large and rapidly growing community around people interested in having conversations with their customers around value. We call it the customer value community. You can find more uh, about that on our website or just hit me up on LinkedIn um, and I can send you more information. And if you're interested in talking about value and how to create an operating system is across your commercial organization around value, uh, I'm your guy. And then the other the last thing I'd say is, 
uh, get Matt's book. It's really great. And listen to Aaron because Aaron, you're brilliant. You do great work. Oh, thank you so much. You're yeah. making me tear up. Thank you. That's very kind. Matt, over to you. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for the, thank you for the plug, uh, Brent. I agree. I was on a call with uh, Brent and uh, Chad um, over at ecosystems, Chad's the CEO and what they're doing is really fascinating stuff. So definitely check out uh, what they're doing over there. Uh, this is a solution designed to overcome one of the big sources of customer indecision. Uh, and it's definitely something you should check out. I learned a ton when I talked to these guys about it. Um, yeah, if you want to pre-order the book, that'd be awesome. Comes out September 20th. Um, we're inviting anybody to pre-order. Send your receipt to pre-orders at joltefect.com. We'll invite you to a launch event. We're going to have uh, Dan Pink, Dave Brock, a number of other special guests there um, to help us talk about the research. Uh, it's going to be sometime in October. We're uh, mailing down the date now because I know Dave's going to email me and ask. Um, and then the, uh, the last thing I'll tell you is check us out at joltefect.com. Ton of resources there, free content, other events coming up, et cetera, So. Amazing. Well, we will be sharing this content. And as I say, definitely get your hands on Matt's book. It's absolutely fantastic. And obviously touch base with Brent with all the work that he's doing as well. Thank you so much, guys. It's been incredible. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see all you very soon. So we didn't get to answer your Thanks, questions. Thanks, guys. Thanks, team. Take, Take care. care. Stay safe out there, everyone. Cheers.